Hello everyone and welcome to Who Wore It Better, the weekly segment in which I review Raw and SmackDown back to back and try and figure out which show won for the week. I have to say both shows this week had a lot of compelling things happening as we build toward Fastlane and WrestleMania, but for a lot of it I couldn't help but ask myself, why? Raw begins with the one and only Bill Goldberg appearance you'll see on this program. He talks about how he's going to beat Kevin Owens for the Universal title at Fastlane. Out comes Kevin Owens. Second week in a row, he's wearing a suit. That's a new record for him. Kevin says he's glad that Bill's in such a good mule. Then he runs down all the opponents that he himself has beaten since arriving on the main roster in 2015. Uh, Goldberg says, let's have a fight right now. Kevin Owens uh, teases the conflict, then says no. Then he says the chance for Goldberg will die on Sunday when he retains the title. Uh, I gotta say... I'm not digging this match. I don't know anyone who's really excited about what's going to happen. No matter who wins the match on Sunday, it's like, boy, I really wish they did more of this build. I mean, I know there's obviously this contractual obligations for, for Bill Goldberg. He can't show up every week. I wish he could. But for something like this, for this title match, you'd think he would be a little more present, that he and Kevin Owens would do something beyond, like, you know, this is the first time since the challenge was made several weeks ago where these two actually share the same, like, airspace together in this build for this championship match. And the, the lack of priority on this match, on this championship match, to me, it just it just uh, doesn't sit well with me. New Day versus the Shining Stars. Wait, scratch that. Actually, it was Rusev and Jinder Mahal. They shoehorned in a gag, a reference to the controversy from Sunday night's Oscar ceremony to the very end of that. Uh, because of course they did. So Primo and Epico are not the opponents for the New Day in this match, which is fine either way because the crowd didn't give a shit about the Shining Stars when they came out, so no one's sad that they're gone. Uh, Rusev and Jinder come out, they have a match, it's a rematch from last week, except the combination for the New Day is slightly different. The heels lose in the dumbest way possible as Rusev and Lana. Rusev, who's in the match by the way, he and Lana are on the outside getting into this shouting match with Kofi Kingston while Xavier rolls up Jinder for the win. And so it's like, it's one thing when last week when Xavier distracted Lana and broke at the iPad and that was a distraction. This was just Rusev was took his eye off the ball and looked really dumb. After two consecutive backstage segments that were awkwardly blocked and overly scripted, it then dissolved to a segment of Stephanie in the backstage and her first words, literally her first words were who wrote this? McFoley arrives on the scene. Stephanie spends the next two minutes just tearing him down, destroying him verbally, which we've seen time and time again now. It's become commonplace. It's become just like, why do they even bother doing this? Now, there is some payoff to this, a small payoff at the very end of the show this week, and I'll get to in a little bit. Um, it's not perfect, but it's something. Cruiserweight time as Akira Tozawa takes on Noam Dar, who is this season's Arya Davari, it seems. And it seems that Noam Dar only exists on Monday nights to job. Uh, this is a pretty short and sweet match. Tozawa finishes him off with the uh, quick German suplex and wins. Uh, the interesting thing about this segment was it was bookended by Brian Kendrick stuff, continuing the conflict between Tozawa and Brian Kendrick. A pre-taped promo showing Kendrick talking about the lessons he's trying to teach Tozawa, and then it ends with uh, Kendrick beating up Tozawa after the match is over and says, that was your third lesson. So I, I like where they're going with this. It's like the build between this and what they do later on in the night with uh, Neville and Gallagher. Women's tag, Sasha Banks and Bailey taking on Charlotte and scheduled to be Dana Brooke. It's not. We'll get to that in a minute. But first, there's a lot of talking and talking and talking between the only three women on Raw who matter. Sasha Banks with the burn of the year. You know what I'm exhausted from? Looking at your stupid face. She should have just dropped the mic and they should have played her music and she was just carried away. Anyway, Charlotte says Dana Brooke is not going to be her partner for the evening, despite the fact it's been advertised as such uh, for the entire night leading up to this point. Anyway, she introduces Nia Jax as her replacement tag team partner. And we, no matter what combination of heels, we've seen this match before. That being said, I love what they're doing with Nia Jax. They're really spending a lot of time building her up as like basically the female equivalent of Braun Strowman, for lack of a better analogy, just this complete dominant monster who's running roughshod through the division. And so she's kind of doing Charlotte's dirty work here. I love the spot where she blocks uh, Sasha's top rope arm drag, just totally stops it dead. I love the spot near the end after she decks Bailey. She catches Sasha Banks in midair and slams her down onto Bailey, hits Bailey with a leg drop and pins her. And so now she has a pinfall victory over the champion. And she already beat Bailey a couple weeks before that as well, a leading uh, a week or two before the Rumble. Sheamus taking on Titus O'Neil, the match that started when they had a scuffle and catering earlier in the night. Uh, this match was very interesting to watch and just see it play out because Titus jumps Sheamus during his entrance. He beats on him for a bit. Like, he's getting this real, like, significant heel. He just beating the piss out of Sheamus for a little bit. Then the bell rings. Titus gets a couple more hits in. Then, bam, bro kick, and that's it. And that was the whole thing. 
and you could just, it was so weird. Like, I was kind of interested in seeing a competitive Titus O'Neil match. I know that's, what, count that as one of the most, probably the most shocking thing I'll say in 2017. You could hear the announcers, like, with their shock and awe. I've never seen Titus O'Neil like this, so aggressive, da, da, da. And then he just gets killed dead instantly with one bro kick, which is fine because the pro kick is a very well-protected move. And I get that. It's kind of, like, very similar to the RKO in that way. But it's, it was just so weird that they would do that whole thing. For this mini feud that's probably not going to go anywhere past this week. It seems where they have this whole story arc, you know, the fight in the catering, and then this match where Titus shows some fire, and he's just dead. Like, and we're probably not going to see anything, any follow-up to it next week. So, makes you just wonder what the point was. Are they going to try and do something with Titus from here on out? Show more of his aggressive side? I don't know. Corey Graves interviewing Seth Rollins. He comes out with a big old knee brace and a crutch and a limp. Boy, it does not look like he's going to be good for WrestleMania. But anyway, he comes out. And this is actually a really, really good promo by Rollins. Probably my favorite of his is by far as a face and here's why I've been saying for months and months the biggest problem with Seth Rollins as a face is because personality wise he has learned so little and changed so little from when he was a heel running with the authority like he never learned his lesson but here in this promo he actually sounds like genuinely we're finally hearing some remorse and repentance from Seth Rollins after all he did Let's say maybe this is karma maybe this is you know it's, it, it's justice for all the stuff I did to turn my back on the shield and everything and Triple H comes out with Samoa Joe flanking him on the other side of the ring actually there's a really brief moment where I thought oh my god is this gonna be a work is like Seth Rollins gonna like clubber both of them with a crutch and be like ah oh, my knee's actually good I'll fight you at Wrestlemania that didn't happen but for a couple minutes I thought maybe that's where it was going Triple H basically says you better not go to Wrestlemania and Rollins says I'm going to go to WrestleMania, and basically it's sounding like they're probably not going to have a match because Rollins was asked by Graves earlier, How's, what's the status for WrestleMania? Rollins says, doesn't look good, and he probably means it, but they're probably going to have, like, if not a match, probably some in-ring confrontation, which, you know, it might not be as satisfying and, like, might not be as definitive as a match would be, but if it's, if it's going where I think it's going to go, then I think it would be a good band-aid on the situation to keep the rivalry going a little bit longer, but to have Seth Rollins standing tall at Mania against, you know, of Triple H after he beats him up a little bit. Who knows? But, like, there's definitely, they're planning for some kind of confrontation at Mania. More Cruiserweight action. This time, Neville and Tony Nese taking on Jack Gallagher and TJ Perkins. This match, another kind of short and sweet exhibition Cruiserweight thing we've come to expect from the Cruiserweights on Raw. Face team wins after Gallagher has has Tony Nese in a submission hold. Neville thinks about making the save, but thinks twice about it after he and Gallagher make eye contact. He backs off. Nese taps out, and Gallagher and Perkins win. I love what they're doing with this storyline. This one feels like it's had a lot of time to build and percolate now. Um, just the contrast between Neville and Gallagher. Both gimmicks to me are so like dated in a way, kind of 80s, especially Neville. The way he talks and the way he cuts promos, and he's so like evil and ugh, all this like all these mannerisms he's doing it's so like old school in like a good way i feel like it's so over the top cartoonish but it's like turning around back on itself to make it actually something interesting worth watching beth phoenix announced as the newest inductee for the hall of fame they're checking the female quota box this week uh you know i'm of two minds on this induction because one i think beth phoenix is certainly deserving when you look back at the package that they showed showing all these highlights and all these innovative things she did like wow she really did all this stuff like it's kind of hard Hard to remember when you consider like how like dead the divas division was during that time period she and natalia were pretty much the glue and also and also eve taurus kind of the glue holding the whole division together for a time but especially beth um at the same time though it's like is it too soon to induct beth phoenix i feel like i still think luna should go in before her I'm trying to think who else from that era or earlier might be might deserve to go in who hasn't been plucked yet. I think China obviously is uh, I think a bigger name, a bigger get for for the for the Hall of Fame. However, I think that's still I think it might still be too soon, and also ultimately it's still the family's decision uh, for whether or not China gets in, and who knows where they're at with that. So I think Beth Phoenix is probably the best choice because uh, they have to have the female quota. They got to do that once a year. They got to have a female. They got to have a tag team. They got to have a minority. They got to have a dead person. And so this week it's it's the female. So I do think Beth Phoenix is deserving. Congratulations, Beth, for the induction. Cesaro taking on Samoa Joe in a callback to their days in the Indies together, which they brought up many times in the commentary here. This was an incredibly physical match. This is my favorite match of Monday night. 
So that's not hard to do because there weren't a whole lot of matches to be had on Raw that were of any substance. Uh, just such a physical match. These two just beat the hell of each other the whole time. Just like Samoa Joe attacking the knee. Cesaro with the feats of strength. The deadlift suplex on, on fat Samoa Joe. Then Joe murders Cesaro with an Uranagi. He wins the match. Then immediately Sami Zayn comes out and he and Joe have this just Big brawl, big intense thing, tear apart brawl. That was a great way to continue this feud here. Show Sami Zayn is not just a punching bag. He will not be denied. And it's a great build for their match in Fastlane. The closing segment of the night was a contract signing between Roman Reigns and Strowman for Fastlane. Why did this need to be done? I thought it was just so weird. The whole rationale, Strowman was like, I don't want Roman Reigns to run away from me, so let's bring ink and paper into this. A match that should have been signed weeks ago. So during his part, Strowman continues to run down Foley, and Foley finally, at the payoff to him getting uh, verbally castrated by Stephanie earlier, finally just mans up and kind of bows up to Strowman and basically says, you need to respect me because I'm a legend, which is a rare, rare bit of selfishness for McFoley in order to prove a point. It, just, it was cool to see that fire in him for just a little brief moment, and I hope it's just like, God, at least he's standing up to somebody. Then Roman Reigns makes the save. There's a big old brawl all over the place in the ring, on the outside, in the arena, in the sea of humanity, the big spear through the barricade going back into the ringside area. Like, they take out the security guard with, like, the world's worst sense of awareness and self-preservation. Like, I don't get why he had to be there. Like, it was clearly, like, a plant. But I don't get why he had to be there to absorb the spear. I thought it was just weird. Because, like, they started to murder him. And, like, they the announcers barely acknowledge, oh, hey, the security guard is dead. So Strowman gets up from the big spear. He shrugs it off. And then he, he and Roman are fighting in the ring. He shoves Roman into the corner. The turnbuckle just flies off when Roman makes contact with it. It's a pretty, pretty cool spot they did there. So Roman's just, like, knocked out. He's the wind knocked out of him. He's laid out. Strowman walks away. And then Roman Reigns bravely gets back up and signs his name on the dotted line and poses with the contract for the cameras to see. I feel like it was a good way to end the show, but at the same time, I'm like, are we not going to have a match at Fastlane after all? I feel like it's shades of Roman and Rusev leading to SummerSlam last year for the U.S. title. They had like a big match, a big proper half-hour match on Raw the week before SummerSlam, and then the match at SummerSlam doesn't happen like it just basically be brawl and the match is thrown out like are we gonna get something like that here at Fastlane because I feel they've given us their best stuff in this segment alone like it was some of the best spots I've seen between the two of them and how are they gonna top that on Fastlane are they not going to even try? Smackdown time. Shane and Daniel Bryan are looking at the monitor in the back, looking at the replay of the finish of the Battle Royal from last week. Still looks obvious that AJ's feet hit the floor first. Then we officially start the show with Miz TV. The Miz brings out his guest, John Cena. He has Cena's mic cut and just begins to verbally berate Cena for a good five minutes. And more of that meta stuff that we've seen for the last like year almost with uh, John Cena feuds. Basically like, oh, you know, you're a backstage manipulator and you're, you're a hypocrite for going on. Hollywood after you bash the rock for doing the same thing. And even though I feel like it's a retread of that whole like kind of wink nudge nod sort of thing we've been seeing with Cena feuds over the last year or so. I still think this is great stuff by The Miz, great promo work by him, really showing you the motive he has for why he's attacking John Cena now. It's like I'm taking away the opportunities from you that you've taken away from me for the last 10 years. Cena's rebuttal promo was very much like a verbal undressing of The Miz, just kind of like bashing. He said, he said, you're a dude dressed as a a dude play another dude. Like, was that a Tropic Thunder reference? I see what you're doing there, Cena. At one point he says, like, if I was such a big backstage manipulator, I wouldn't be standing across the ring from you. I'd be standing across the ring from The Undertaker. It's like, oh, okay, you're kind of killing this feud right now, Cena, by just, you know, they're shoveling the dirt, shoveling the dirt. But Cena's promo game is still very strong here. Made some very good points about The Miz in this dressing down of him. Be talking about how his whole career has been like you've been copping other wrestlers' styles. Like you short your name to The Miz, like The Rock, you know, when you're in the real world. You stole Ric Flair's figure four. You stole, you know, Chris Jericho's suit and mannerisms. You stole Daniel Bryan's offense. Cena is going to walk away, and then Maurice cuts him off, slaps him, and that brings Nikki Bella out. The heels powder, and then we get this kind of, in a, in a way, kind of a historic moment moment on WWE TV because we've known for years Cena and Nikki Bella are an item but this has to be the first time 
outside of reality television where we've seen the two like have public affection in the ring on TV like a real acknowledgement of their ever since the relationship was acknowledged on TV this is the first time we've seen it like publicly like you know out there in front of the crowd and everything so kind of a historic moment there uh, when they embrace and kiss in the ring so now we're definitely seeing this is the match we're going to be getting at Wrestlemania the rubber match is two out of three falls match between Becky Lynch and Mickey James I'm not going to go into like a blow by blow thing about this match I will say that Mickey James won the first fall after a Mickey DT Becky wins the second fall after Mickey misses a top rope uh, attempt and then she gets rolled up by Becky then in the third fall Alexa Bliss comes out to try and distract Becky it backfires when Mickey hits Alexa off the apron she gets caught in the disarm her and Mickey James taps I mean there was nothing spectacular about this match but I thought it was a good match for what it was I thought you know I think two out of three falls is always a fun gimmick to pull out and they don't do it that often but when they do they usually deliver the first hour had a lot of talking the Miz TV segment uh, took like almost 20 minutes of airtime then after the two out of three falls match there was a Luke Harper promo a Bray Wyatt promo and Alexa Bliss promo in which Natalia comes in congratulates Alexa but says I'm coming for your title boops her in the nose then there was an AJ Styles promo a lot of talking at this point this first hour but then it leads into the Luke Harper AJ Styles match to determine who will face Bray Wyatt at Wrestlemania Harper hitting Styles with like everything he has he's got like a suicide dive to the outside an absolutely disgusting dragon suplex that Styles sells beautifully a powerbomb Styles kicks out of all this stuff in the end uh, or what you think is the end Styles has the phenomenal forearm on Harper covers him Harper clearly gets his foot in the ropes but the referee does not see it counts to three and so you think Styles wins but then wait a minute Shane McMahon comes out he says no 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 the match is too important we can't have the match end like this so we're restarting the match I find it very funny that last week they said oh the referee's decision stands it's a draw even though it's clearly not a draw and then like Shane McMahon says nope referee doesn't count here we're doing the match over because you know we have a replay the match restarts maybe goes for another 60 to 90 seconds here Styles at one point outside the ring yells at Shane for a bit Shane inadvertently destroyed by a kick by Luke Harper Styles uses the distraction to knock out Luke Harper in the ring gets him with the springboard 450 in the middle of the ring and pins him one two three so Styles wins again and is now officially going to be fighting Bray Wyatt at Wrestlemania or so we think really weird to see Harper losing twice here in this segment you wonder where it's going to go because you would think that if, if this if the rumors are true that's going to be Styles and Shane at Wrestlemania this would be the jumping off point to have you know Shane restarts the match Styles feels cheated Harper wins the match and goes on to face Bray Wyatt and that's when they have their clash Dean Ambrose makes his way to the ring nice knowing you Kurt Hawkins Ambrose grabs a mic and says he wants to fight Baron Corbin uh, Corbin shows up on the screen says you know I'm not going to fight you just yet but I will inflict pain I wasn't really paying too much attention to what he was saying because I was so distracted by him just like shuffling and doing this the whole all of, he just plant your feet Baron that's all I'm saying Apollo Crews versus Dolph Ziggler in a chairs match continuing their feud Ziggler makes his entrance first but his jump from behind by Apollo Crews but a tip for tap from previous weeks Crews kind of like what Harper did to Styles Crews just hitting Ziggler with everything he had you know looking so strong but ultimately can't put Ziggler away Ziggler with the thumb of the eye then he dropped toll holds uh, Cruz throat first onto the top of the chair sells that for a bit then he groins him picks him up groins him on the chair Ooh, like that's more devastating somehow than getting like you know chopped in the throat with the chair instead Ziggler rolls up Apollo Cruz and wins the match um, you know it's a fast paced physical match you know for TV for all the chairs they had strewn about they only used maybe two of them and I don't even think they used, except for the finish didn't really even use them all the, to the best of their abilities but I think this was a good look for Ziggler here. As long as he keeps winning, then this heel turn, the things he's doing, will be good to me. Two shows back-to-back -back Monday and Tuesday where the shows don't end in actual matches, but rather talking segments. You've got this thing with uh, Bray Wyatt's invocation in which he just basically comes out and says, I'm spooky and evil. And then uh, who interrupts him but Randy Orton, who's reporting live from the Wyatt Family Compound. A very interesting segment they have here where he basically says, I used to say if you can't beat him, join him. Now I say, now that I've been here long enough, screw him. He reveals sister Abigail was murdered and was like buried in a shallow grave at the bottom of this shed. And like that's where she's been this whole time. They show the maggots and the worms and everything. Randy says, I'm coming for your title at WrestleMania. He really explores the space of the shed with the gasoline. He's got like five or six different cans of gasoline. He uses every damn one of them. He goes outside. He lights the thing on fire. And the whole shed just bursts into flames. Randy Orton does his pose. Because I guess that's a 
good time to do it. And then Bray Wyatt's like losing his shit. He's just freaking out, fade to black, and I don't know what to think. I thought it was a really cool way to end the show. I thought it was a great visual, and you have to tune in next week to find out what happens. But it's like, on one hand, it's like, this seems like a really convoluted way to get to this point. Because like I can, I can buy the idea that Orton was like buying time and like just trying to lure Bray into more of like a false sense of security before he strikes and challenges him for the belt. But the whole idea of like, I'm not going to fight you and we're going to have these two weeks of build where we're like, the two weeks were used to set up other WrestleMania matches, but I feel like you could have gotten to those, the, the John Cena Miz thing and, you know, the AJ Styles Shane thing without having this whole, this whole red herring where Brandy doesn't give up the, you know, the championship match. I'm sure within a couple of days or like next week, it's all going to make sense. I'm like, oh, okay, I, I, I am totally on board with this now. But at the same time, it has a lot of questions. I'm like, how are they going to transition this with AJ Styles, who's the number one contender? How are they going to transition that into a match with Shane McMahon? Like, where is Luke Harper going to fit into this? Is this going to be a triple threat after all? I don't know. It's like, I mean, they've got 30 days or so to make it work. And I'm very, very curious and interested and excited to see where it goes from here. Time now for me to decide who won for the week, Raw or SmackDown. And folks, it's not a slam dunk like it's been in some cases, but I am going to give SmackDown the win this week. Let's start with Raw first, talk about what I liked and didn't like. I really enjoyed Seth Rollins' promo. It's like the biggest, most refreshing change of pace for him. Like, it sounded so... So nice to hear him, you know, finally, like, in his character, like, admit to his wrongdoings and have some remorse. Like, that was the one big stumbling block for his face turn, and he finally got over the hump. And I'm really happy to see that they finally turned the page of that. Joe versus Cesaro, again, we could see better from them. Hopefully, we will see better from them down the line. No commercial breaks, but I think the match was, for what it was, very intense, very physical, very fun to watch. I like what they're doing with both high-profile cruiserweight uh, feuds, with Tazawa and Kendrick, the way they're building that up, as well as the stuff with the cruiserweight championship. Again, I love heel Neville right now. And the the, stro- the, bra- the brawl at the end between Strowman and Roman Reigns was top-notch stuff, really, really exciting stuff, but my biggest problem with that is, have, has it peaked? What's going to happen to Fastlane that could possibly top what we saw on Raw? Is this a dead giveaway that it's not going to be the way we kind of expected? Um, oh my God. The, I didn't mention this earlier during the Brawl thing, but fuck the CM Punk chance. Seriously. You know, you got Rollins who's there with his knee brace and he's pouring his soul out to you and you're chanting CM Punk. God damn it. Like, why did The Rock have to bring the CM Punk chance back? Like, we were over CM Punk chance. We were almost done with it. And last week, The Rock comes out, he calls CM Punk on his phone and people will go ape shit. And then, oh, now the CM Punk chance are like, back. Great. I love it. But meanwhile, on SmackDown, you had a much more engaging show with the whole thing. I felt like it was kind of like a substandard pay per view, if that makes any sense. Like, a lot of variety and a lot of interesting gimmicks to the match, the two out of three falls, the chairs match, uh, just a lot of extra talking. The, 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 pr- the promos that bookended the show, the Miz TV stuff, I loved that promo almost segment for what it was. Again, depending on what side of the fence you are about John Cena determines who you think won that promo off. And then, of course, the stuff at the end with Randy burning the compound while Bray Wyatt's tearing his hair out going nuts. My one issue with SmackDown this weekend, it's kind of a nitpick, is just make it makes the last two weeks and how they're going to tie everything back to WrestleMania seems super convoluted. It seems like it's a weird detour that didn't need to be taken in such a way. I mean, we all knew Orton was going to turn on Wyatt eventually, but the fact that he was like going so far as to like give up his match at WrestleMania only a psych, I'm getting it back. Seems kind of contrived, and I'm, I'm curious to see where it's going to go. I'm not going to detract too much from the experience from that, but it just seems like, seems like a weird detour to get to this point. But anyway, I say SmackDown wins for the week. Let me know what you thought about Raw and SmackDown in the comment section below, and don't forget to vote which show you thought was better in the poll right here in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. Be sure to thumbs up this video if you like it, subscribe to Wrestling With Regret, and buy the t-shirts at ProWrestlingTees.com. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.